we have answers. Slashing is um, like that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And um, there's a penalty for that? Yeah. You do that, you go to the box, you know, two minutes by yourself, and you feel shame, you know, and then you get free. This is CBJ in 30. Anything you folks want to know about the fascinating world of pro hockey, here we go. Tweet your questions by using the hashtag CBJIN30. We'd like to remind you folks, keep your questions within the boundaries of good taste. Here's your host, Bob McGilligan. And welcome to another edition of CBJ in 30 here on this Tuesday morning headed toward lunchtime. If you're listening to it live, if you're listening to it later, well, even though the time has passed, the content is just as good. Bob McElligot with you, taking your questions and your comments, and you can send those to me just by going to Twitter and using the hashtag CBJ in 30. That is CBJIN30. Send your questions and your comments just like that, which is uh, what uh, a lot of people have already done, and that's what I'm going to get to today. Let's start with the playoffs. They resumed last night, and they did so in Montreal, where the Montreal Canadiens fell to the New York Rangers for a second straight game, and the final score in that one last night was 3-1. to one. Um, Was it dominating? Yeah, I think it was, and it was dominating really by one guy, and that was the goaltender of the New York Rangers, Henrik Lundqvist, 40 saves in that game last night to lead the Rangers not only to their second straight victory over the Montreal Canadiens in that series, but also to their fifth straight win. Now, there was a, a lot of talk yesterday about the fact that Carey Price, the goaltender for the Canadiens, is out for the remainder of the season. Or the, Well, that's a, uh, that's a slip of the tongue. I said season. I meant to say series. It looks like the series could be the season for the Montreal Canadiens right now. But uh, Carey Price is gone. He's not going to play again in that series. And they opted not to go with Peter Budai, the backup, yesterday. They went to the American Hockey League, brought up Dustin Tokarski, who has uh, a lot of a lot of experience in the American Hockey League. Uh, he's got world junior experience. He's a guy that has a very good resume of playing in big games, Memorial Cup games. He's, that's why they went with him. They felt that... Uh, well, well, we're going to give the kid a chance. Now, I don't know if giving the kid a chance at that juncture is such a great idea. Now, for me to say that and really harp on it just goes completely against what I said last week when John Gibson got called up from the American Hockey League from the Anaheim Ducks and got inserted into the lineup. But here, here is one difference. Uh, Gibson made a difference immediately upon getting in the net. That did not happen for the Montreal Canadiens last night. They lose the game. But, again, it wasn't so much about their goaltender because when you look at that game, to me, of the three goals he gave up, I think the Rick Nash shot should have been stopped. I, I think that one with the three-on-two break and they feed it over to Nash and it looked like it kind of got him uh, got him on the sleeve as he was sliding from his right to his left. Puck goes between the arm and the body, kind of nicked the sleeve a little bit there. I thought that one he should have stopped. But – it's very easy now, the hindsight 2020 model, to go back and look at that and say, okay, so if he stops that, what's the final? Two to one? When your team only scores one, I tell my son this all the time, and there are games that he plays very well and loses in goal. There are other games that he's just not good in goal and his team loses. Okay, it goes both ways. But here's the deal. When you come off the ice after a two to one or a three to one loss, and if you have played well, then my line to him is always, listen, here's the bottom line. The only way you win that game is by getting a shutout because your team only scored one. Or if you get shut out two to nothing, well, your team didn't score any. You were looking at a 0-0 tie. So you know, that's kind of the case last night for the Montreal Canadiens. They got one. And the story was all about the goaltender. But it really wasn't about their goaltender. It was about the guy at the other end. And Henrik Lundqvist. And this obviously is the wild card in any playoff series, a hot goalie. But to have a, a hot goalie who also happens to be one of the best goalies in the world is making things very, very complicated for the Montreal Canadiens. As the the Kings have now – or the Kings. The Rangers have now won five games in a row. Five games in a row. Three straight against Pittsburgh to knock them out. The first two against the Montreal Canadiens. In that five-game winning streak, 
Henrik Lundqvist has a goals against average of 1.29 or something like that. This guy's not giving up two goals a game. Okay? So what does that mean? By the numbers, if you score one goal, you're looking at a 1-1 tie at the at the best because this guy's not giving up, you know, or you either win one to nothing or it's a 1-1 tie. That, that's what he's giving up, basically one goal a game right now. That's tough to beat. That's really, really, really tough to beat. And he turned aside 40 last night, and he was great, and he got that offensive support. He got enough. You know, he didn't get seven like he did in game one. He got three, and three was plenty the way he played last night. So the Rangers are on a roll. They're going back to Madison Square Garden for game three. The Montreal Canadiens left their home ice last night knowing there's a good chance. Right now, it looks like there's a really good chance they don't play another home game this year. And, again, that's not all because of the goalie. But let's look at that goalie situation. And now because it's very easy to go and and, uh, be critical of it because of the way it turned out. If Toharski comes up and he wins the game, Michel Therrien's a genius for putting him in that. Boy, that's why he's a coach. He knows way more than I do. But when the guy loses, even based on the pedigree that he has, when he loses, there are a lot of questions. And then, you know, you've, you've got to you face the fallout from that. So why him instead of Peter Budai? And here's my thing. And, I, you know, Peter Budai is not the next uh, coming of a – Con Smythe winning goaltender, don't get me wrong. But he's been in the league for a long time. He's been a solid backup. Again, during the regular season, he's a guy that they would throw to the Bruins. Like, they'd throw him in the in the cage with a bear, and he'd come out as a winner, right? So they'd put him up against Boston throughout the course of the regular season. They played him against him a couple of times. He came up big. You know, to me, from that standpoint, he earned the opportunity to start in that game. And in that series, it didn't happen. And, and, again, I understand why it didn't happen. I understand what they were trying to do. Uh, you know, sometimes maybe you get too smart for yourself. And uh, and that could have been the case last night. But the bottom line is, here. the other thing about that whole Peter Budai situation is he is a consummate teammate. And he's a guy that a lot of the Canadians players seem to be surprised that he wasn't going to start. And, uh, and I think they kind of felt bad for him. So now what does that set up? It sets up a game three. And to me, there's a goaltender controversy because, you, it, to me, it's 50-50. You could throw the same guy in there and say, well, you know what, he played well, and we're going to give him a, another shot. Or you could very easily say, we gave him a shot, it didn't work out, we're going to try this guy in this game. And maybe because he is so likable in the dressing room, maybe guys rally around him and, uh, you know, great things happen. I don't know. It's Again, it's you don't play it on paper. You don't you don't play you play the game over and over in your mind, and you think you know what's going to happen, but you never know what's going to happen until it's played on the ice. But it'll be interesting to see what the decision is for the next game, as to who goes in between the pipes and starts that for the Montreal Canadiens. But as far as a Montreal fan is concerned, it doesn't matter because the guy will not be named Carey Price, and that is where I'm sure they feel, you know, uh, Chris Kreider he got booed every time he touched the puck last night. And that'll happen for the rest of his career, no matter what happens in that series. So uh, he is public enemy number one in Montreal. So he's probably glad to get out of there and get back to New York. And the Rangers will look to take care of business and try to finish things off. There is no game tonight, the two-day break between uh, Chicago and Los Angeles. Does that help the Kings? I guess maybe because they just played a couple of seven-game series. Now they get that extra day off. We'll see. You know, it's easy. That, that's another thing. It's easy to say, well, that'll help them. Uh, they can regroup a little bit. They can rest. They can, not, Well, really, can they? They're in Chicago. They're in a hotel. They're not, you know, I mentioned yesterday this team was at home for 38 straight days because, or not home, but they were in the state of California. They didn't have to do that much traveling. So are, are they going to be, they'll be rested because they had a chance to uh, get some downtime, but they're in a hotel and they're they're going out to eat. It's not like they're at home and they're with their families or anything like that. So, We'll see how that plays out uh, tomorrow. But it's still going to be a great game. And it's going to be, as I said yesterday, I think it's going to be a real dogfight between those two clubs. Did you see what George LaRock said the other day? Was it yesterday? He uh, he was talking about uh, the calls that are made or not made in the Stanley Cup playoffs right now. And he was talking about playing for Pittsburgh during the 07-08 season when Michelle Therrien was the head coach. 
and they were playing against the Philadelphia Flyers, and the Penguins thought that the Flyers were running Mark Andre Fleury, that they they would purposely run into him and they were crashing him, and it was you know they the Penguins were sick of it. And George Lorac said Michel Therrien told him to go run the goaltender on the other end, which was Martin Biron. So he went, and he ran him, and he got fined. And he said the team took care of him and paid the fine. And this has made huge headlines. <gasps> How could they do that? How could the team pay the fine? Here's the bottom line. This stuff happens all the time. <laughs> I think everybody was just shocked he said it. I was shocked. When I, when I, when I read it, I was like, huh, I'm surprised he said that. I remember, and this is a, a totally different level, but when I was in Syracuse in the minor leagues, there were ways that uh, guys were getting fined and getting taken care of. There were creative ways, too. They were paying the fine, but they might be able to find a way to, you know, maybe they got some of that back. Maybe. I don't know. I never got fined. I heard I almost did once. My owner called me one time and said, you almost got fined by the league. I, I saved you. Because what did I say? Oh, I, I remember now. I said that um, I think an extra second had ticked off the clock. And I, and I said, that's what you call home ice advantage. If that whistle blows and the clock goes one more second, it happens everywhere. And uh, the league didn't like that. And, uh, well, again, there was another thing. That was true. I have that happen sometimes at youth hockey games. I really, I try to trigger that thing, and I just, you, you know, I eh, anyway. CBJ and thirty is the hashtag CBJIN30 for you to use and send me your questions. And uh, there, there are a bunch of them. Jody is going to kick it off today, and the question is: Signing Alexander Winberg, does this give him a better chance to eventually play at the NHL level? Well, Jody, not only does it give him a better chance. It gives him his only chance to play at the NHL level because you have to be under contract. But I know the question that you're really asking here is, now he has signed that contract now, does that give him a better chance of playing here in the fall? Well, of course it does. No doubt about that. But he's still going to have to come in this summer. He'll come into the prospects camp, and uh, he'll do his work here, and he'll go through all the physical activity, and they'll, they'll check him out and go through all the strength testing and all that stuff. He'll have to come back in the fall. He wants to be here in the fall. He'll go to the Prospects Tournament in Traverse City, and he'll play there, and he'll go through a training camp, and then the decision will be made. But I think uh, for him signing that contract says two things. Number one, it says that he's ready to come in and compete and do all of those things. And number two, which is in this case probably more important than number one, the Columbus Blue Jackets feel that he is ready to come in and compete and do all of those things. So that's why he has a contract. And uh, yes is the answer to your question. That is going to give him a uh, better chance to eventually play at the NHL level. Jonathan has a question, and this question is, do you think Lumbus should be in the dictionary? Lumbus. So I, uh, I've i seen this all over Twitter, and I really did have to ask the origin of that. And the answer was that the Los Angeles Kings – shortened Columbus to Lumbus and started tweeting that, and then it caught on. I don't know why. I don't think it should be in the dictionary, quite frankly, Jonathan, because I think it sounds lazy. I think if in L.A., if they're too laid back and too lazy to put the C.O. in front of the rest of the word, it shouldn't wind up in the dictionary. Then again, remember when a comeback used to say, uh, uh, the little saying used to be, Ain't ain't in the dictionary. Ain't ain't a word. It ain't in the dictionary, and I ain't going to use it anymore. I think it actually is now in the dictionary. So for me to say no, Lumbus shouldn't be in the dictionary doesn't mean a thing, because now there are like twelve dictionaries anyway, right? There, because there's the uh, there's a dictionary of slang terms, as well as real world. I should well, for me to say real world is not right. Proper English dictionary and then the way we all talk types of dictionaries. So that's all I have to say about that. Jordan the Hoff says, thoughts on the backup goalie, re-sign Curtis McElhaney or look outside the Blue Jackets to bring one in from the system? I don't know if they're going to bring in from the system. In fact, I say no, they're not going to bring in from the system. To me, it's either Curtis McElhaney or outside the organization. 
and bring in somebody that has uh, more experience in that regard. So uh, you've got guys under contract now. Anton Forsberg finished the season in Springfield. Oscar Dansk has now signed a contract. Jonas Corposalo is signed. There, there are going to be a lot of goaltenders that are looking for a place to play in this organization very, very soon. But it's going to start in Springfield. And I would imagine, this is my guess, I don't know, I'm not putting together that roster, but the Springfield Falcons, who have had veteran goaltending the last couple of years, starting with Curtis McElhaney two years ago, and this year having Mike McKenna doing the bulk of the work down there, don't be surprised if the American Hockey League team goes to a young goaltender this year. They have to. These guys are going to have to play. You're going to have to find out if they can play, and that's where they're going to play. Nobody's making the jump to the NHL and backing up Sergei Bobrovsky. You have to play. You have to perfect your skills. You have to prove that you can play the pro game before you move on and be a backup. No, it, it, it makes no sense for an Anton Forsberg or an Oscar Dansk, either of those guys, it makes no sense for them to be a backup here because they won't play. They'll get practice time, but they won't play. And you've got to play. You're looking for minutes. You're looking for ice time. And that's what they're going to be looking for for those guys. Bender Dimmick says, just how good will Jack Johnson get? Will he stay in Columbus when his contract is up? Well, his contract runs a long time there, Bender. And he's going to stay here. I think he's going to stay here for a long time. I think if he if he goes into next season coming out of uh, the summer the, and picks up where he left off in the playoffs, and I said this after the playoffs, you can't play the way he played through six – Stanley Cup playoff games for 82 games. You, you just can't do it. I mean, he was a beast. He was a monster. But in my opinion, he was like that from the time the Olympic break ended through that first round of the playoffs. So he was big. I, I thought he took on a much bigger role defensively. I thought he got meaner. I thought he was more physical. You know, offensively, he, he chipped in. He did his part there. But I, his his game came up a level for whatever reason. People will still talk about the fact that he didn't get selected by Team USA to be in the Olympics, and, you know, he's trying to prove everybody wrong. Fine, fine. Just prove him wrong for another three years. That's fine. Because when Jack Johnson plays the way he did from the end of the Olympic break through the first round of the playoffs, he makes you a way better team. No doubt. Way better team. Every every bit of it. So uh, that is that's exactly the way he's got to play. And he's got to do that more days than not. Kind of dovetailing off that, Austin Capel says, what is the best way to keep the momentum that was built this season going into next season? Well, the momentum will be there. It dies down in the summer, obviously. You get excited about, uh, you know, some of the things. You'll see what's added at the draft. You'll see if there are any moves made through trades before the draft. You'll see if there's anybody signed during unrestricted free agency. Then it goes quiet for a couple of weeks, and then that momentum starts to build when training camp comes. But, again, it comes back to the same thing. How do you how do you keep that momentum? You come out of the gate strong. You don't come out and go 2-8 and eight in your first 10 games. You come out and go 8-2 and two in your first 10 games. You go 6-4. and four. You make sure that you're above the line. You make sure that you're playing the team kind of game that you want to play right from the get-go, not uh, waiting three or four weeks to, to get things going. So that's going to be the biggest key. Come out, and I think that happened this year too, really, because of the way last season ended. Then you come out, and, and it was really a big buildup for that first game against the Calgary Flames. And then they lost that game. And yet, there are a lot of hardcore people, such as you, that will shrug that off and say that's one of 82. And there are a lot of fringe people who are still trying to get their head around how this whole thing works here that are saying, man, all that, they've talked about this for weeks, and then they lost that game. Well, yeah. And, and was that to a very good team? No, not on paper and not at the time. But that's that's the way this league works. You know, These are the best players in the world, and there's 30 teams. So even when you play a team that's perceived as not one of the best, that doesn't mean it's a cakewalk every night. No way. So you maintain the momentum by coming out with a good start. You don't have to go 10-0. and but you do have to go six and four, seven and three. I think. 
I, and I think that's the organization is going to – people are going to be held accountable for that, starting with players and coaches. You cannot start slowly again, especially now that you are a target and other teams are going to be looking to knock you off and take away that playoff spot that you had last year. So you can't get off to a slow start. You're going to have to come out of the gate competitive, and you've got to be there because you don't want to be chasing. The last thing you want to do – this team – uh, two seasons ago, they chased, and they almost got there. This season, there was a point they had a chase. Then they got in the lead. They were chased. They held on. They got in the playoffs. You know, if you continue to progress and take those steps, next season you want to get off to the good start, and you want to be chased the entire year. You want people looking at you and saying, how are we going to catch the Blue Jackets? How are we going to knock them out of a wild card spot? How are we going to knock them out of the one, two, or three spot in the Metropolitan Division and grab that spot for our own. That's what you want. That's the biggest biggest compliment in this league is to be chased and for people to want to be where you are. And that's why they've got to put themselves in that position right out of the chute. Troy Current says, I think uh, Nathan Horton allows the Blue Jackets to trade Umberger and promote from Springfield. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah. And, and again, when it comes down, we went into this yesterday, and if you – didn't hear the conversation yesterday. Go back and listen to the podcast from yesterday. But you've got R.J. Umberger, who uh, reportedly has asked to be dealt. He's got a contract they have to deal with. They have to find a way for it to work for the organization. And if they can help him out, great. And if they can't help him out, well, then they're going to do what what's best here, um, you know, in those regards. All of that being said, uh, again, there are young players that are on the verge. And so this is – one of those situations where, yeah, it would be – I know ideally you'd love to call Pittsburgh and say, hey, how about we give you R.J. Umberger and you give us James Neal straight up. That stuff doesn't happen, right? So, uh, I mean, if you could do it, you'd do it, and boom, that's great. But more than likely, you have young players that are pushing for a spot, and that could possibly create a spot for a young player. CBJ Therapy says, how do you feel today if you're Peter Budai? He handled it well, but he's got to be hurting inside. Yeah, for sure. No doubt about it. He probably needed some therapy when he found out he wasn't going to start. And I'm sure he knew a lot earlier than anybody else found out, for sure. That's a tough call. It's a tough call as a coach, and, I, and I'll bet you it was hard for Michel Therrien to tell him he wasn't going to start that game. Because when you have a guy that's been there the entire time and he's been the number two guy and he's done good work for you and then the other guy gets hurt, you know he's thinking, okay, well, I've got to take the bull by the horns here. This is my show. And then to get told that it's not, that's tough for a coach too. There's no doubt. But, um, again, you handle it like a pro, and I think that's why he's such a popular teammate. What they do from here is anybody's guess. We'll find out. Uh, Mark Scheig says, how similar is the rise of the Blue Jackets to that of when the Blues were developing? It's funny because when John Davidson came here from St. Louis a couple of years ago, I remember one of the first things that he said was that this team was much better stocked than the St. Louis Blues were when he took over that franchise. And it was very easy to scratch your head and go, really? Really? Because th things are kind of they, – they appear to be in shambles. But he was right. He was definitely right because look what has happened in such a short period of time. So is it similar? Uh, I think it's similar, but they, you know, they they already had one foot forward going into this whole thing. And I think the other thing about it is – with John Davidson going through that experience with the St. Louis Blues and, you know, resurrecting that franchise and getting them to where they are, he had a better idea of what he was doing too. And we saw that when he switched general managers. I mean, when it, look at Pittsburgh fired Ray Shiro last week, right, last Friday. So this has got and, – and this whole rampant speculation is going on. I heard today Pierre Maguire is going to talk with the, with the Penguins about the GM job at some point, which would be great just to get him off TV. But anyway, I'm kidding. I, I really don't mind him as much as a lot of people mind him. He can. There are things he can say that can actually hold my interest. Now that you've tuned out to what I'm saying. But anyway, um, but really, so here's that Pittsburgh situation. It's like it's hanging there, right? Jason Botterill is an assistant GM who's been promoted to the interim title, and he, he doesn't, you know, nobody knows if he's staying or going. He doesn't know if he's staying or going. Everything's all in flux. Remember when John Davidson made the change here? He came and he walked to the podium that day and he said, I'm relieving Scott Housen of his general manager duties and I'm hiring Yarmo Kekalainen. <laughs> and it was done. 
Now, why is he able to do that? How does he figure all that stuff out? Why is he so decisive? Because he's been through it before. He's already done this once. And he knew the pieces that he had when he took this job. He knew the guy that he wanted to handle the pieces and get the other pieces he would need for this thing to be successful. So similar, yes. And then after that, just about surrounding yourself with good people who you know can get the job done, who you trust, and let them go do their thing. That's what's going on right now. Guys that were hired to do their thing are doing their thing, and it's working out well. Jacket Jim says, once the cup has been decided, what the heck am I to do to keep out of trouble till the fall? I need something to keep me busy. Well, let's see, Jim. <sighs> well, you got the draft after that, and then the free agency period, and then you've got about six weeks. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what you like, though, Jim. I mean, you have to – you got to give me something. Do you like to play golf? Do you like to fish? Do you like to just hang out? Do you like to sit around a campfire and, you know, play guitar? I don't know what you like. You gotta, you gotta give me a little bit more info. You gotta give me, help me help you. In the words of Jerry Maguire, help me help you. The good news is you still have a couple of weeks to before you even have to worry about all of that stuff. Greg Montgomery says potential trade. Umberger for Marcus Foligno. Thoughts? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I don't see the Buffalo Sabers jumping on that. Uh, and then again, and don't forget, if Umberger reportedly has asked to be dealt, and if you know he's got a, he'll submit a list of teams that he will not go to. So who knows who's going to be on that list? But Greg goes on to say, "What do you think about the chemistry between the Felino brothers?" I would, I said during this year, I'd love to have Marcus Felino come in here some way somehow. Because Marcus and Nick playing together, first of all, the chemistry would be great. They get along great. They hang out. There are two brothers that play in the NHL who have a dad that played in and now coaches in the NHL. Bring them all if you want to in some way, shape, or form. So uh, I think it would be great. It's great to talk about and banter about between you and I, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know that uh, that would happen. I don't think it would happen in what you're proposing. I know it wouldn't happen in what you're proposing because the, the numbers just don't work out my boy bunk Tuzi has sent in a question today how long did it take for you to get used to the cannon now that is uh th that's a question i can take two ways how long did it take when i first got here or how long did it take to get used to it firing off three four five times a game it didn't take me long to get used to the three four five times it did take me a little bit i i, I forget you know when i get caught at the same time a lot of other people in press row get caught. They um, they get caught when the team comes out on the ice right at the beginning of the game. And they fire that thing off. And if I forget about it, it still gets me. Still gets me. Gets to me. Right in the heart. Uh, here's another one. Why do you think more teams encourage players going to the World Championship instead of the Olympics? Same risk, right? Do they encourage them? I don't think the teams encourage them. Look what happened to Alex Ovechkin the other day. There was a point a couple of days ago where people were saying he might not play again or might miss significant time, and then he was uh, then he was all of a sudden walking around with no crutches, and he was fine. So uh, that you know it's a risk you take when you play there, and I, teams cringe. They cringe at the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics was one of the things they were talking about. You know, they, they worry about injuries. And then you have Tavares goes down and he's out for the rest of the year. And, you know, they worry about it and then it happens. But I don't know if they think that if they have this uh, World Cup of Hockey thing that nobody's going to get hurt or what because they're all behind that. So, I don't know. The players want to go play in the World Championships. They want to play in the Olympics because they want to represent their country. It's an honor. It's an honor they appreciate. And I got to tell you, if I had the chance to do that, I think that I would do the exact same thing because I said this at the Olympics, around the Olympics, how many chances are you going to get to go represent your country? Not many, especially not in the Olympics when they're only every four years. So if it was me and they said, you want to come, you want to broadcast for your country, 
By goodness, I'd salute and I'd be there in a heartbeat. Well, that's going to wrap up another edition of CBJ and 30. There are no playoff games tonight, so I don't know what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But I guess the good news is I have 23 and a half hours to figure it out. Until then, Bob McElligot saying so long. I'll talk to you.